Welcome to the Deep Dive, brought to you by Inside Texas Football YouTube channel, powered by InsideTexas.com. I'm your host, as always, Justin Wells, and with me, as always, is Paul Waddlington and Ian Boyd. Please like our video and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. We are climbing up that's to 7,000. Help us out. Also, come see us at InsideTexas.com. We're running a special for a dollar that gets you through the spring game, that gets you into the portal season, and it gets you all up on the recruiting stuff. But today... And like we do in every deep dive, we're going we're gonna to talk about some team. We're going to talk a little bit about Sark's favorite RPO. And then we're going we're gonna to continue a conversation about quarterbacks in the SEC because Paul thinks this is going to be a better conference of quarterbacks by the end of the season. And I think he's probably right like usual. I'm going to start it off with Ian, though. Hey, man, Sark's got a favorite RPO. This is things you've talked about and written about. Dive into to the details of this and just what it means to, to this offense in 2024. Yeah, anybody that watched Monday Night Live, we talked about this a little bit. We had a source that watched some practice cut-ups in a coach's clinic that Texas did, and he got to see a lot of cut-ups of the same RPO over and over again. Uh, and Texas was just dicing up their own defense with it. This is the play. This is the play as they ran it last year and as you see it with the Miami Dolphins with uh, a few tweaks that they that they were doing in, in spring. And the way it works is it's like the old school zone read with Vince Young. But instead of the quarterback's option when the unblocked defensive end, if the unblocked defensive end crashes and, and chases after the running back, instead of pulling the ball and running around the edge like Vince Young did, Texas has a series of pass options available to him. And so it's like a two-read play. It's like almost like a triple option. Um, and the way that the the way it works here th that it was being described was they would line up with all the receivers in the boundary. So then defense has to figure out how to line up to that. Like, do they have the nickel lineup over there? How do they how do they account for all those guys? But then they motion the slot, the H, all the way across the field. And then at the snap, they motion the Y across too, like he's going to block for split zone. Only instead of blocking, he just runs out into the flat. And the defense has to process all this like that because it's right before the snap and then right after the snap, all this movement. Then they're running outside zone into the boundary. And if you don't have any guys left there because everybody's scattered after the motion, then you just run the ball behind Kelvin Banks and DJ Campbell and all these guys, and you pick up an easy 5, 10, 15 yards. If you don't, if you actually adjust to the motion half decent and you're in crashes after the running back, the quarterback will pull the ball, and then he's got this glance route by the Z, where the Z is basically just running into open space. He's got a wheel route outside if there's man coverage, and then he has the the tight end coming across into the flat late. Um, if you want to see this play in action last year, Texas ran it and a few different looks off of it against Oklahoma a bunch of times last year. And then they didn't really run it the rest of the year I think probably because most of the rest of the teams they played were flyover teams, and those teams would just drop everyone back into coverage. And so it didn't create the same advantages. They'd do other stuff. This year in the SEC, they're not going to get the flyover every week. They may not get it once. They're going to get teams trying to play them legitimate, man coverage, four down fronts, all that. And so now this RPO takes center stage for Texas, and uh, it's it looks like a lot. Um but it's almost like just like a base concept for them, just like the, the just like the veer for a wishbone team or something like that. They're going to run it a couple of times every game. They're going to run play action and screens that are designed to look like this, but then catch you for your overplays. And that uh, sounds like this is going to be a really big deal next year. Ian, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, is, the, you... is the X receiver a viable option or is he just clearing space? Just, just a clear out route. Yep. Ian, can you tell me in 2024 terms which guys are going to be in which spots that we think right now? Well, that's part of the fun of this because if they make this a mainstay in the offense, they could do it a million different ways, right? They could put Jaden Blue and Baxter in the backfield, have Jaden Blue motion out and run the wheel route. They could have, uh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff they could do. But I, I guess the main thing is you want a fast guy running the wheel. You want a reliable guy at the Z or the X, whoever's running the glance. That You want that guy to be reliable, 
makes the right read on the cornerback's leverage and is running to the right spot. Um, the running back is going to be the running back. It's not pretty simple there. And honestly, probably all the receivers will be able to do all of the different tasks. They may even um, – USC runs – stuff sort of like this with Lincoln Riley. And sometimes they'll put their ultra fast guy as the Y to run the little flat route. And then the little easy check down becomes just a way to get the ball into the hands of like a Jeremiah branch, or in the case of Texas, maybe uh, Silas Bolden, right? You put him in the backfield and just have him run that little flat route. The other team covers everything. They force you to check it down, but then you're checking down to Silas Bolden in space and you have to tackle him. In terms of the run game, that obviously that's an option on this, right? In, in fact, it could be the preferable option, right? If yeah. the defense guards it in a certain way, you just just an auto handoff. Yep. You're talking outside zone, so you're seeing the the play side tackle up on the top. He's going to hook that end, right? Who's who's responsible for getting out on the linebacker? Is anyone, or are you counting on not getting a flag? if you do pull it and have to throw it, like what's, what's the read there? Like for the run to really go, you need to leak someone out on that linebacker on the play side, especially, but maybe even the backside. How do you balance that with not getting a penalty or are you counting on like big 12 refereeing carrying over to the sec? I usually don't draw it out because it's usually based on reads of the combo blocks, yeah. but basically you're going to, the center is going to try to reach that tackle and the guard is going to help him and hopefully just kind of give him a shove into the center and then, and then climb up to the, to the linebacker. I guess what I'm asking is what if that linebacker doesn't move forward, right? What if he just stands at in space? Are, are you risking a penalty when you leak out on him? Like what? I'm oh, gonna... almost like a spy. Yeah. 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 So what Paul's referencing is if your offensive linemen get more than three yards downfield, then you will get maybe flagged for having maybe. an ineligible receiver down the field when your quarterback throws the ball. Right. Um, I, I think that the benefit of running outside zone with these RPOs is that it's usually a, the, the linemen go lateral first before they get down the field. And so it just creates a little bit of time for the quarterback to make the read and potentially get the ball out before they're getting the, before they're leaking downfield. Um, and I, <laughs> If he, if he hangs back, I mean, he's really at risk on a running play if he just stands back there, right? I, you're, you're a little bit counting on him not doing that. Because, <laughs> um, for one, that there's so much action going on that he's probably going to trigger pretty fast, especially mm -hmm. if he sees Banks going wide and Connor or Campbell going wide or whoever, and he's going to be like, okay, my gap is moving. I got to get somewhere quick. And then uh, – if he does stand back and you don't throw it, then he's going to get killed and they're going to get gashed so bad uh, unless they play it really well somewhere else. So you're, you're mostly counting on that just not happening, but I, there's like some chance of it because of what you outlined. Ian, if, if, if there's not much flyover though in the SEC, what's going to be the counter defense for this? Because obviously it'll be put on tape. Obviously it'll work. What would be what would be the defense's mindset? Because at some point they're not going to be able to go straight up man on on a Sark offense. What's the next call? Oh, uh, good question. <laughs> I have a little bit of wait and see there. I noticed that um, by the end of the year last year, whether they were playing a flyover team or whether they were playing Washington, the main strategy from teams was to play like off man coverage and to have a single deep safety, but to drop him back just way the heck back like okay. make sure that worthy and mitchell do not get behind you back and stay in the middle of the field and then they would just kind of play 10 on 11 against the run and that's partly why texas was able to run the ball so well even after they lost jonathan brooks was because teams were like well you're going to run the ball but we're going to try to stop you in the red zone because we know that mitchell or worthy will beat us in a play and uh you'd think that maybe that's would be where teams would pick up but Texas also has all new receivers, so they kind of got to prove that they can actually reliably take the top off like they did last year. Last year, the second game of the year, they play Alabama, and Mitchell and Worthy both beat Alabama's secondary over the top. 
Yeah. And so everyone from then on out in the Big 12 and on the schedule knows if Alabama can't stay on top of these guys, we are not going to stay on top of them. And so everybody played them differently from then on out. They'll have to earn that again. I was going to say, Ian, and you'll remember, so what happens is you show something early, you scare everybody, they play off, and then someone goes, I don't know, Kansas State, their first half game plan. I, I don't think this Adonai Mitchell guy is that good. Surely we can single cover him out on, you know, in, in space. And Texas <laughs> burns him again, and Kansas State revamps their game plan in the second half. Hey, you mentioned OU. And I, this, I'm glad you did because that this is the play or the base of it where Quinn hit something like 19 passes in a row, right, in that second half, uh, just tearing up OU 10, 12, 18 yards a chunk. And at first, Venables tried to blitz this, right, which is kind of what you want. You want people to blitz this if the quarterback will deal the ball out quickly, which Quinn did. And then I did see a couple of plays where OU would drop their end into coverage. And then they have the linebacker blitz inside of him. And the idea is we're going to muddy the quarterback's initial read. And then maybe he won't notice the, the, the blitzer coming from, from depth and we'll get a turnover or cause a hurried throw or something like that. Uh, was there something OU did in the first half? And by the way, that wasn't successful, but, was there something OU did in the first half sitting on some of these routes that caused Quinn and the you know receivers to miscommunicate that caused the turnovers early and the, the incompletions? Or was that just game jitters? Um, I think they ran it more later in the game. Yeah. You know, Oklahoma didn't really, like you said, they didn't really have great answers for it. But the interception on Jatavian Sanders was actually this play. They had... So where, where we have the Z, they had uh, Jatavian Sanders at tight end run that route from an inline tight end position. And it actually worked like a charm because he ran wide open right in front of the end zone. But Ewers threw it a little bit high. And so like our money sign safety here, because of the compressed space of the red zone, that guy was able to get all the way over and smack Jatavian Sanders right after the ball got there. And then the ball floated in the air and somebody else picked it off. And by the way, that was Bowman. Who's a Billy Bowman, his childhood old. friend. Who's a <laughs> tremendous football player. Yeah, yeah. excellent player. Yeah. Um, especially at stuff like that. So there was that. But that was more just a feature of a great play and compressed space. Like between the 20s, Oklahoma just got wrecked. And if yep. like a lot of times they'd have their end hang back in coverage so that your quarterback never gets to all these pass options and you don't have to worry about them. But then Jonathan Brooks broke a couple of long runs when they did that. Yep. Because now you're playing uh, five on five on five in the run game with no, it, it just didn't work out very well. <laughs> and, and, you know, the outside zone, just to, to mention, so obviously you want to get pressure with your defensive lineman. Right, not just that edge, but the interior guys, the backside guy. If the quarterback holds the ball too long, right. The problem is outside zone welcomes penetration because if you run up the field, they're just like, "Oh, great, yeah, we'll carry you up the field. We we're going over there." Like the the running back will just extend their their cut and go right further out. If you penetrate, they just bypass you and. The only penetration that's valid against outside zone is on the correct. If you got to penetrate on the correct side, and you've got to do it early to make the the back take more depth and take a longer way around. Yeah, but that's it's it's a really interesting play if you can get really slick and proficient at its execution because there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. It's really tough to defend. I think where it does get short circuited is the instance you pointed out, Ian, where you don't execute it decisively and quickly and, and process all these multiple things going on. Because, you know, the defense gets a vote too, right? They get to line up in different ways and show you different looks. So this is awesome. The, uh, one more note on that, because you mentioned outside zone and the benefits of running this with outside zone. They actually ran it more with inside zone in the last couple of years. And that was one of the tweaks for next year is that they're running it more outside zone. And our source noted that both Banks and Cam Williams, when they are the play side tackle that the, the, 
are blocking on the direction the running back is headed. They were both routinely hooking the defensive end. Wow. Winning to his outside shoulder. And that is really hard. That's like an (laughs) NFL level block. Usually you're happy like the defensive end over penetrates and you just push him. But they were hooking him. And what that does is your linebacker, your Mike linebacker that you were worried about, well, what if he kind of hangs back? He can't hang back if the end gets hooked. He's got to go replace him or there's a wide open edge. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I look forward to it. I think he was saying that Campbell was pulling around also some too. Wow. Like sometimes, yeah. So, well, that's that's an area too where Cole Hudson, if he's able to win out, he demonstrated repeatedly on pulls. He's really good. Hayden Connor makes contact and makes the block. He yeah. just doesn't get the violent finishing that Cole Hudson and, and sometimes DJ Campbell can bring. Yep. Like Paul says, he's a, he's a screener, not a driver. Yes, he's a screener. I'll tell you somebody that's that, that's really good at defending RPOs and defending anybody. That's Andre the lawyer. Hey. <laughs> You got to call Andre the lawyer at 214-444-8808. Andre helps everybody he can, including Longhorns with car wrecks, slip and falls, 18-wheeler accidents, uh, on-the-job injuries, wrongful deaths. Andre is a proud Inside Texas reader, but he will help anybody. If you ever get stuck, if you ever get in a position where you need somebody to help you defend that RPO or defend you in the courtroom, Andre Andre the lawyer is your guy. Give him a call at 214-444-8808. Zero eight, Gentlemen, last week we talked about a little bit about SEC quarterbacks, and it was mainly some of the guys on the schedule. But there were so many, and we ran out of time, so we're going to bring it over to, to part two. And we've got some interesting guys that we can talk about uh, today. <laughs> we were talking about it in pre-production, and um, there, there, there's, some, there's some interesting quarterbacks in this conference, much more than I, than I anticipated 30 minutes ago. Uh, let, you know, we're going to start off with guys on the schedule, continue that trend, and we'll go, we're going to go through Michigan State, we're going to go through Vanderbilt, and we're going to go through Florida. And let's start Michigan State. Mississippi State, we're going to go that route. We'll, we'll try Starkville, not Lansing, uh, one side of the you know, country, not the other. Um, let's start with Mississippi State with a quarterback that looks pretty familiar to the Big 12 and to the Texas Longhorns. And uh, you go with it, Paul. Yeah, familiar face, Blake Shapin has left Baylor and is going to be the head coach. He's going to be playing for head coach Jeff Levy, running that offense. He's going to put the ball in the air quite a bit. They're going to put the the game on his shoulders and try to be respectable in year one. Mississippi State was gutted um, by graduation, by by the portal a little bit. They lost Will Rogers, who's who's been the quarterback there forever. And yeah. it's going to be the Shapin era, uh, or at least a one-year era. He's 23 years old. He started a bunch. He's played a lot of football at Baylor. You know, what's interesting is if you ask the, the layperson, you know, what do you think of Blake Shapin? I think a lot of people say, oh, he's not very good or he's average or, and I get it. But if you look at his numbers, his career, 36 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. So almost a three to one career touchdown to interception ratio. I have watched individual games where Blake Shapin has played really well. Uh, obviously, Texas did not play against him last year. Uh, they have played against him the the year previous. Uh, I think he's athletic, somewhat limited in terms of his arm strength, but not a bad college quarterback. And I think the best Mississippi could, State could do on short notice, I think he's capable of running Levy's offense. And I think that's the main thing. Uh, if you don't remember Shapin very well, he's about 5'11", 205, 210. Uh, got a pretty good arm. He's... he's He's not a true dual threat, but I'd say he's very mobile, pretty athletic. He was a very good baseball player. And like I said, he's an older guy. So he is going to be the guy for Mississippi State. I I frankly don't think Mississippi State has a ton around him. They actually did a good job in the portal. And we probably will do a feature on portal additions and portal losses as we get after these spring practices because we're going to have more additions and losses. Good idea. But uh, Levy did a pretty good job on short notice restocking some key aspects of Mississippi State. But I think shapin has got a tough row to hoe, uh, but he is a familiar quarterback that we're going to be able to, to go against. And uh, I think he'll probably have his hands full with the Texas defense. I noticed, Paul, that um, he had problems up till last year. Like he looked like he played like second base or shortstop previously. And that was maybe more his natural uh, sport. But he would 
the problem would be that he would bail on the pocket early. Yes. And he was very comfortable throwing on the run. Like he was like trying to turn a double or something, but he would just get himself into trouble. But then last year he seemed very improved in that regard, but he tore up his knee. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious like you, I, I I've seen a lot of things from him that make me think he might actually be pretty good if he can be healthy. At minimum, he's a competent college quarterback, right? Uh, yeah. it's, it's hard to be 36 and 13 touchdown interception ratio and, and stink. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and Ian's more subjective analysis is right. He had a really bad habit of bailing early on the pocket, trying to use that mobility. It's a bad habit a lot of quarterbacks who are athletic have from high school, right? Because you can always extend the play. But yeah. you play a higher order defense. You play a Texas team that's going to have Burke and Simmons and more out there running around on the edge. And suddenly you're going to find out there's guys that weigh 240, 250 who are faster than you and better athletes, and they're going to just run you down. And so I think he did address that bad habit. And in fact, before his injury, he was playing really well for Baylor. So uh, I think I, I think Levy did a good job. And Justin, you were going to say that you think he could run Levy's offense? Yeah, I mean, for what Levy's going to do, they're going to, you know, he's going to have one read. And if he has two, they're going to tell him from the sideline or if, if they do the calm and the, and the helmets. Uh, yeah. You know, for, for what shaping can do, I think Levy will gear it around that, yeah. what, 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 you know, his positive attributes. And so, you know, Texas fans are a little familiar with shaping, obviously, playing at Baylor, that they've seen him a handful of times. They're not, I don't know how familiar Texas fans are with Vanderbilt's new quarterback. I do know that our man Paul Waddlington is a big fan. And I got to tell you, after after learning about this guy, I think I'm a big fan too. Diego Pavia. Did I, did I, did I butcher that? Diego Pavia is, he is a very entertaining player. He's a colorful personality. He was the star quarterback. He was the one man gang at New Mexico State. And if you weren't keep paying attention to that program, they had they were a, 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 as more abundant and awful a program as, as ever existed. And Jerry Kill became the head coach. He yep. made Pavia his quarterback. And they have gone to consecutive bowls and had just amazing seasons for New Mexico State. Uh, Diego, my favorite sports are football and the combat sports. I love the UFC. I love boxing. Diego's right up my alley. He was a <laughs> all-state championship wrestler in high school. And he received major college wrestling scholarships, like Nebraska, Oklahoma State level, like legit. Dang. And he decided to pursue his passion, which is football. Diego plays the game like it's a combat sport. He is a quarterback, but he is more than happy to meet you after the game in the alley and, and sort things out as well. He's about he's listed at six feet. I don't think he's five, ten and a half, but he's 200 pounds and he's a wrestler, which means he can level change and he's fast. And he's a dual threat quarterback. He throws the ball like he like your ex-wife is throwing something at you as she's walking out the door. <laughs> he he's a competitor and this guy lays it all out on the field. And if you guys remember, New Mexico State went into Auburn went into the plains exactly. and humiliated Hugh Freeze, what, 38 to 10? Diego was the the juice behind that. And in that game, he threw an interception, and the Auburn defensive back is running up the sideline. And Diego, the wrestler, kicked in. He ran, double-legged him, picked him up, and body slammed him in front of the Auburn bench, caused a big bunch-clearing brawl, and, and it got New Mexico State all fired up. Uh, Diego is also the guy who famously peed on the field of the rival New Mexico during a, a practice during the week of warm up practice. And when he was asked about it, he basically shrugged and said, uh, F them. So uh, <laughs> Diego is going to bring some competitiveness to Vandy and maybe a little edge that they've been missing. So that sounds like a natural fit. For, for the yeah, Cardinals. he's just a Vandy guy all the way. A bunch of guys with collar pops <laughs> he has the name Chet and Chaz. And then Diego Pavia going around uh, getting in bar fights. Last on the schedule, the last one of the last ones we wanted to talk about, and to me probably the most interesting because of the dynamic in that room and what Billy Napier is going to be facing in the 2024 season, it's Florida. It, 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 you know, the Gators are coming to Austin this season, and their quarterback is Graham Mertz. But I'm hearing Graham Mertz might not be the starting quarterback by the end of the season. 
Uh, they've got a freshman that came in from Willis, Texas, a 5A uh, or 6A rather player of the year in, in, in DJ Lagway. He was a big, big kid. Dad, dad played linebacker at Baylor. Um, Eric Nolin, our buddy at, at Inside Texas, we actually met Derek as a sophomore playing baseball. Uh, really good kid, really competitive kid, a kind of kid that could turn around a program, could turn around an offense, but he's going to have to unseat Graham Mertz first. Ian, you know, where do you see, you know, you, you were a big fan of Mertz at Wisconsin. You, you had lauded about his passing, you know, threats and abilities. What do you see going on at Florida? Like, what's it going to take for Mertz to, to, to keep that job? Is, is it wins and losses on the schedule to keep, you know, Napier in Gainesville? Or are they just going to go with the, the freshman and, and, and all the upside that comes with it? Yeah, you, you brought this up pre-show, and it's such a good point. Because Napier is going to be under a lot of pressure to win games, and there are just no wins on the schedule. There's no gimme wins. Like right. their non-conference games are like uh, UCF is like one of the easier ones. This team is probably going to be pretty good. And then uh, Florida State on the road to end the year. And then I think who's there? Miami. Miami. I feel like they play another team too that I can't remember. Maybe I'm so they're playing that. all the state schools in one season. Yeah. I can't and remember anybody doing that. And they're playing Georgia and they're playing Tennessee. And I think they're playing like LSU or something. They're playing Coming Texas. Texas. God. Yeah. They also <laughs> host AM and Tennessee, by the way. Now, I mean, all those teams I think could be very good. Yes. Uh, it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible oh, they also miss. <laughs> God. So I mean look. I think Graham Mertz, when I watched him in Wisconsin. I actually thought he made some good decisions and some good throws at times, but their their offense was bad. He didn't have receivers. He was under pressure all the time. He played pretty well last year. Um, they don't seem to have like another NFL receiver to bail him out. So they feel they seem like they're they could be a team that could be very good, but just do not have the overpowering talent anywhere on the roster to get them from like a six and six type of team on this schedule to where Napier needs to be to stay. So to your question, I would think if Napier is thinking, look, the only way I can keep my job is to play this freshman, flash some things and make people say, well, okay, we went five and seven, but maybe we should stick it out with this freshman and see what could happen in another year. Then I would probably make that move after a few losses with Mertz and maybe like midway through the season or something. Are you, would you say the very beginning? Cause I don't think you can just bench Mertz out the gate. I feel like your team might quit on you if you do that, unless Lagway is just dominating in practice. Is Mertz that entrenched? I mean, he, if you look at his numbers last year, you'd be shocked. It was like 25 to three touchdowns to interceptions. Um, nearly 3000 yards. He played pretty okay. well. Yeah. I mean, he's a good quarter. If, if Mertz knew that he was like going to be screwed out of a job because of these political dynamics, he could transfer and be the starter at a number of very respectable schools. So I would, if I were going to play the political game and I'm Napier, I would wait until the season is already pretty entrenched as being like, uh, we're not doing better than like six wins this year. And then I would put Lagway towards the end of the year and see if we could manufacture some hype and momentum for the next season. And then I, and I, then I don't have to worry about the, the bottom line and the standings as much. Yeah, I mean, from a, a political, tactical career extension standpoint, that might be the play. But, I mean, Florida's problem was defense, right? I mean, they, yes. they can't stop people from scoring. And they cleaned so. out the coaches. Well, if yeah. they're bad on defense, then he'll be fired, right? Yeah, and and honestly, we as an aside, we've talked about the playoff, and that you know there's going to be a nine and three team that makes the playoff. Uh, if this Florida team goes nine and three, they deserve the playoff. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt. And in fact, I think they should be a high seed, right? I mean, they, should the, yeah. they should be the five seed. So uh, I don't think that's going to happen, though. But uh, so Mertz, to your point, Ian, th- twenty touchdowns, three interceptions last year. They did have a very risk-averse passing game. It was basically a forward handoff a lot of the time, but he executed it well. 73% completions, almost 3,000 yards, as Ian said. 
And that was a contrast to Wisconsin. He threw 26 interceptions in his career at Wisconsin before throwing three. He was, he was loathed by the Wisconsin fan base. Part of it, I think, to Ian's point, they didn't understand the poor offense and the poor support system around him. Uh, but I, I think he was a pleasant surprise for a lot of people because when Florida took him, that was a that was like a lot of people laughed at him. Like, what take Graham Mertz? And obviously they saw something in him that that the film was a little deeper on him than, than people thought at cursory level. So he's going to be an interesting guy. And will we, Texas, even see him? You know, that's Ian's point that's interesting. And to tease next week, we're going to cover another group of SEC quarterbacks, gentlemen. And one of them is being lauded as one of the top three or top five quarterbacks in the country. And it's possible he may not be the starter, say, halfway through the season. It is I, possible. I love – Listen, only thing I love more than the deep dive it, it, is a tease. And Paul Waddlington brought it today. This Top to bottom, we killed it on the RPO. We killed it on the SEC quarterback section. This this is just good content. This is just good YouTubing, guys. Yeah, Absolutely so appreciate it. But really, though, I appreciate the viewers and for you guys for tuning in and making us a part of your day. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Deep Dive. Please like and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Please come to see us at InsideTexas.com. We really do have a great time. It's a great community. There's always a lot of fun. And we learn all these interesting anecdotes about all these different players, including a quarterback from New Mexico State who's probably going to be in the WWE when he finishes his term <laughs> in Nashville. Gentlemen, Ian, Paul, thank Thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us on the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com.